Episode 82, Billionaires in Space. And welcome back for another edition of the Syzygy Podcast. Joining me as ever, this time from what looks like her living room, Dr. Emily Brunsden. Hi, Emily. How you doing? Hello, hello. Yep, thought I'd mix it up and just sit here in the sunshine and enjoy this lovely, well, I suppose we're going to get a heat wave later this week, so let's get get ready for it. The great English heat wave. What's it going to get up to? High 20s? Oh, careful, everyone. <laughs> Better put the, put the sunscreen and the sunglasses on. It could get scary out there. So, Emily, you have been uh, doing some stuff since last we spoke. I want to, before we get into today's topic, which is, which is all about people spending a lot of money to go to interesting places in the universe. But we'll come back to that in a minute. But first of all, I just want to congratulate you on one heck of an effort in walking, what, most of the way, half of the way, some of the way across this, this crazy country. You've, you've been out for a walk, I believe. Yeah, just just a little walk. Um, well, um, we just walked just a little walk um, in the woods. Just under half of the uh, coast to coast walk, which goes through northern England. Uh, so three national parks. It was absolutely gorgeous. I feel like I'm, I must have been charmed by some kind of universal force of weather because we walked through the entire Lake District without a drop of rain, which has never happened to anyone ever, as far as I can understand. I, I don't think that's ever happened. No, in the history of everything ever, I don't think anyone has spent that amount of time. How long were you out there? Like an entire week. Um, and, and, yeah, yep, just and over walk, a week. Like anywhere in this country and spending that amount of time without any rain. So I don't know, I don't know who you spoke to. I don't know which gods you prayed to, but whatever it was, it worked. So well done. How far did you walk in all? It was fabulous. Um, ooh, I can't. I think it was about 140, 150 k's. Whoa, that's so, that's a long yeah. way. So averaging what about 20, 25 a day, twenty five k's a day? Yeah, it's very really about that. Yeah. So that's not really when you do it over a whole day. That's we we. It must be said there are people who do the coast to coast and really like quite intense. Um, you know, much, much um, shorter days, longer distances. They rack through the whole thing really, really quickly. We're taking it quite cruisy, quite leisurely. We're doing it the kind of five-star um, trip, yeah, which but is some, really rather nice. Some people are just ill, though, Emily. I mean, you know, you can take these things to extreme. So, I look, I'm not back and back from this at all. Well done. A solid effort. And listen, as a segue into today's discussion you walked 150 k's would if you'd done that vertically would that get you to space absolutely and even more so (laughs) so you would have gone well and truly which is quite weird when you put it that way yeah you would have gone well and truly into space i mean i always think of it kind of the other way is is it actually doesn't like it doesn't seem terribly far away space when you think about where you know the the space station, the the International Space Station is. It's like it's it's actually just up there. It's it's not very far away. Like you could walk it in a in a not terribly long period of time. Whereas we tend to think of space as being a really long way away. It's actually not so far. And that's one of the things that we want to talk about today. Because unless you've been living under a rock, then you've probably heard that there are a bunch of billionaires who are very very keen on flying to space, which is something that. Most of the time throughout history of the human race has either been utterly impossible for anyone or only possible for highly trained astronauty type people, right? It's been, it's been something that only a very select number of people can do. And now it's been opened up to the entire population of multi, multi, multi billionaires. So, you know, it's, it's becoming just a little bit more egalitarian <laughs> as we go along. And the first of the billionaires to go to space this week was Richard Branson, who's, who's one of the, the local team from here in the UK. Uh, Richard Branson strapped himself into a, to a sort of space plane type thing and took off and went to space. And he was the first, except that then there was a bit of controversy from the other billionaires saying, well, you didn't actually go to space though did you because space begins in a different place and it's all it's all very complicated we're watching a bunch of billionaires basically just having a little a little fisticuffs in the playground so that's what we wanted to talk about today and the reason we're talking about that today is not just because 
bunch of billionaires going to space. It kind of fits in with with our you know our podcast topic of uh, of preference, but also because Emily, you're actually apparently a bit of an expert on this. What's been going on? How 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 are you an expert on billionaires going to space? Well, I guess. Somehow along the way, you just get caught up in these things. So I got a call on um, Sunday morning uh, from Sky News asking if I would become a expert friend for one of their reporters who was live um, on the scene where um, the Virgin Galactic um, spacecraft was launching from. And they just wanted someone who kind of knew a bit of science, I guess, to you know add some uh, credibility to some of the things that people were saying. So... I thought, you know, okay, this is this is great. This is exciting. You got to add credibility to Sky. Well done. <laughs> this is great. This I mean, it's exciting. a it's a real shame that they didn't they didn't fly you over there. That would have been fun. Where did it actually launch from? Where did it where did it go? So, it's Spaceport America, which sounds like it should be in a film rather than actually yeah, in reality. Yeah. But um <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's in New Mexico in the in the desert. Right. So they didn't go so far as to actually whack you on a plane, get you through the quarantine protocols and get you over there to do it live. But you did get to be expert friend, which I think I think you need a business card made up with that. I think, uh, hello, I'm Dr. Emily Brunsden, expert friend of, uh, of Sky. I think that'd be awesome. So Emily is the expert on all these things. And look, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here, Emily. I think it's quite possible that you did more research into this topic than was required for your stint on Sky? Would that would that be true? That is absolutely the case. I mean, this is one of these things, right? You get called up by a major media company to come and like, talk about something with some sort of sense of authority. You just get that kind of p- panic sets in. I know. I know. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> well, the panic for me, the panic sets in and I think, golly, I better not say anything completely wrong because if I get, you know, basic physics wrong, like which direction gravity goes, then I'm going to be really laughed at for all of eternity let alone you know you're gonna look like a bit of a goose yeah 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 yeah. so you did lots of research uh and and how many of that how much of that did you actually get to talk about on the uh on the actual show yeah all in all i I did a couple of segments over the two hour window yeah probably about one (laughs) percent Okay, so today we're going to cover at least a little bit of the other 99% of all of the research that that Emily did into what it means to strap yourself into a large, powerful, rockety type thing and send yourself upwards in the direction of space. So, Emily, why don't we begin with, this is a flight into space. And normally we think about, like, you know, astronauts sitting atop of what is effectively a very large controlled explosion. And they're in the very, very top pointy bit of the of the long rockety thing. And the rest of the long rockety thing is basically just storage for fuel. And they, they light a match under it and off it goes upwards and they drop bits of it off. And eventually the, the very top little bit gets up into space with the astronauts in it. That's the usual way. But this one, this Virgin Galactic flight with Richard Branson and a few other people on board was not that. It was something quite different. So can you just, why don't we start with what kind of space rockety thing was this? Yeah, it's it was one of the things that made, I think, the whole watching the event live quite surreal and not, and it's surreal and it's really a literal form. It did not feel real because what we're looking at here is something called what they call the Spaceship 2 space flight system, which they've made deliberately difficult to say, I think. There's a lot of sibilance in that. <laughs> which has a carrier aircraft, which they call White Knight 2. And the particular carrier, uh, in this case, the one, the, the particular one was called Eve, VMS Eve. Uh, and that carrier aircraft, it looks kind of like a cross between aeroplane and a catamaran. Right. So it's sort of twin twin hulled thing, is it? Yeah, aircraft hulls, but a catamaran because there's two of them and there's a big gap in the middle. So it's it's a bizarre looking thing. Yeah. What's in the gap? What's that for? Ah, so the gap, the gap is where the 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 rocket, the um spaceship goes. And this oh, is called um spaceship 2, which is was called Unity this particular model, let's say, of Spaceship Two. Gotcha. Okay. And that's kind of slung underneath the two um, other fuselages of the uh, carrier plane. So it's, it's, it's a bizarre thing to look at just in the beginning, because you've basically got three 
aircraft which look like they've had a horrible accident and become merged. <laughs> yeah, straight out of the gate, it's already looking a little bit troubling. But but here we are. Okay, so this literally takes off from sort of an airport. This is not a rocket pointing upwards towards space. This is, we're going to take off and just, we're going to pretend like this is nothing special. We're just a plane. Just a plane taking off for a normal flight. Is that is that what it does? It just takes off like a plane. That's exactly what it does. Right. And that was, I think, for me, the biggest aspect of surrealism of the whole thing. Because you think going to space, you think astronauts, you think you're going to strap yourself to a lot big pointy thing, point it at the sky, light a match and go boom, and then you get up there somehow. That's, right? that's the usual model. Yeah. Yeah. Not that you're going to go to an airport and be right up close to this thing. I mean, you know, the, the, the media and all the spectators were at the airport, which was, you know, the similar sort of distance that you'd be if you were at an airport for a commercial aircraft. Yeah. Not, you know, tens of well, kilometres away from this big thing that's going to basically explode on the ground. So already that was quite a weird sensation. For a normal rocket, you don't want to be anywhere near this thing when it goes off because you're not going to be there anymore. You're going to be literally just blasted away by the sound and the fury of, of a rocket taking. I mean, these the, a rocket launch is, is an enormous explosion of energy. It has to be to get this thing off the ground. Whereas this is a much more sort of gentle thing where, where we're just taken off. But, but it's obviously different to a normal flight. For starters, the plane looks a bit weird. So, okay, we've, we've got that one. We've got this sort of catamarany thing with a, with a, a strange thing sort of strapped into the middle of it. So... At what point then does it start to diverge from this is just a standard common or garden variety aeroplane flight? What happens after they take off? So they take off and they use this aircraft to take them up to somewhere around 15 kilometers above the surface of the earth. So now if you're sort of familiar, I'm going to be working in kilometers here because kilometers make sense to yes. me. I know other units are available like tens of thousands of feet or miles, but most of the time, they just confuse me. So <laughs> I'll try and kind of anchor you a little bit, and, and at least in the beginning stages here, because it does kind of make sense too. But no, no, so, no. Let's just go with kilometers all the way, kilometers and meters all the way, and everyone else be damned. Look, if you're not happy with kilometers, go and get yourself a book of tables or something. We're, we're going to go with SI units. Thanks. Right. Well, on on that direction then, your commercial aircraft are normally flying at around 12 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. So that kind of gives you a sense. Military planes um, very regularly fly at about 15. In fact, military planes can fly higher than that. They can high up, uh, fly up to 20 kilometers, sometimes even a bit more. Um, but yeah, you, can, you you know, you run of the mill. I'm going to fly from Sydney to London. It's going to be kind of around that 12 kilometer mark. Cool. So we're up. That's we're we're up around 15. That's where the where, that's where the plane's going. And the the plane is taking the the central actual spaceship bit all the way up to there. So we're, we're getting up to that height. But so far, this is nothing special. This is just a military flight, right? Yeah, which is I mean, it's quite interesting, really, because actually what you're doing is you're already crossing the first boundary in, I guess, the, what we call the layers of Earth's atmosphere. Now, as it's going to become vastly apparent when we talk about actually where does space begin, the Earth's atmosphere isn't a solid object. It doesn't have a boundary that is defined by a line. And, you know, Earth's atmosphere comes up to here, there's a nice sort of delineating line, and then there's space. Fluids are rarely that, that simple, are they? Exactly. So basically, the definition of where is space is a decision that people have made. And that's true of all the layers in our atmosphere as well. They're decisions. They're based on some scientific evidence, though. So, so already we've gone kind of, I, I, and I love this because I didn't know much about atmospheric physics. So this is one of the rabbit holes that I really went down on Sunday to get myself up to speed. Okay, well, let's go there. Let's do it. Tell us about the layers of the atmosphere. So already by the time we're up to 15 kilometers, we've actually traversed the first layer. So the troposphere is um, this bottom layer. This is kind of the, the atmosphere that we kind of live in on our everyday lives. Um, and it actually... It only goes up to about this 12 kilometer mark and it contains 75% of the mass of Earth's atmosphere. So it's kind of pea soup for us. Yeah. It's really dense. We're just sort of swimming around in it. Yeah, that's that's a lot. And sorry, it goes up to it goes up to how far? What's the thickness? Up to 12 kilometers. Okay. So that's 75% in the first 12 kilometers. All right. 
So that's the troposphere. So once you pass over this completely arbitrary and human-defined boundary between one bit and the next, you go from the troposphere to where? To the stratosphere, which is actually a real thing. Okay. So the stratosphere, troposphere, then stratosphere. So by the time we are getting up to 15 kilometers where we're well and truly, what, into the stratosphere? It's Yeah, just above it. Yeah, so we're going from 12 to 15 as stratosphere. In fact, the stratosphere goes all the way up to 50 kilometers. Wow. Okay. All right. So it's, it's, it's that thick. So what... What makes the stratosphere stratosphere and not troposphere? Is it is it just simply what well, we had to draw a line somewhere or is there actually a fundamental difference between these two layers, given that we've already decided that, you know, it's an arbitrary boundary? But what is it that makes the stratosphere the stratosphere? Well, one of the main interesting things that I found that makes this a different sort of atmospheric layer is that all the other layers of the atmosphere that we're going to talk about have the same temperature change basically the higher up you go the colder it gets and we you kind of know that you know that you get ice up in very high altitudes um, and as the earth's atmosphere gets more and more rarefied it gets cooler however the stratosphere just does the opposite the, the stratosphere is hotter at the top and cooler at the bottom in fact it's about minus 51 degrees at the bottom and about minus 15 degrees, which is almost balmy at the top. Hmm, that's not too bad. You know, I've been outside in minus 15, and it's cold, but it's not too bad. You know, you can put on a decent decent coat and a woolly hat, and you're okay. So that's what, why does it do that? Why is it inverted like that? So it's to do with the solar heating. So this is what, the layer where the um, density of the atmosphere is just enough that the sun's light at the top is actually warming it up more than it's losing energy from being too disperse. So is that what makes, like, is that the definition of the stratosphere? Is it's this inverted layer of of atmosphere above the troposphere? Is, is that kind of how it's defined? Yeah, loosely. I mean, remember that these things change, right? So boundaries will change depending on where above the Earth's surface you are, what the season is, what the local kind of climate is doing at a particular time. So, yeah, the, I mean, when I say that these things are at these kind of kilometre marks, each one of them is probably plus or minus kind of between two or three and maybe up to five or ten in some places. Sure, sure. But let's let's sort of take these very rough boundary layers as, okay, troposphere, stratosphere, fantastic. So backing up a little bit then, we're, we're in our weird catamarany, rockety space plane thing, right? And we've flown above where normal passenger jets go and we're up into the stratosphere, which is where you can still find, you know, uh, military planes and so on. So at this point, 15 k's above the Earth, we are still in normal flying territory. Then what? Well, this is the exciting bit because this is when the carrier aircraft, so EVE, detached the middle bit, the air, um, sort of the space plane itself, which was Unity. And so it just kind of just drops it. <laughs> Right, okay, it's hanging on one second, and then now we're not hanging on anymore, you're on your own. Cool, all right. And it's at this point we're changing over from the physics of flight to the physics of propulsion. Right. And the reason is because this boundary is really important. It's important for the density. Basically, you, um, you don't have to use as much fuel in your rocket if you start up higher, because getting through the first few layers, getting the momentum up to begin with, takes a lot of fuel. And that's what they're trying to avoid by having this carrier aircraft to begin with. Right, right. I guess that makes sense. That if you can if you can save that last really big, we're going to push up into space for when there's much less atmosphere. Is that what they're doing? That they're, that they're saying, let's let's just gradually get up to this, this really high bit and then we'll really give it a good jump from there. Yeah, exactly. So that's when the rocket boosters start to fire, the whole space plane points at the sky and just goes up. Right. So this is we're now getting to the proper rockety bit now. This is this is what you would recognize from past experience with pointy things going up into space. We're now doing that. Cool. But we're just doing it from much higher up. Exactly, yeah. So we've taken sort of maybe 40, 45 minutes to get up to this height, but then the rocket's going to burn for about 63 seconds, 
And that's going to take it to the peak of its um, trajectory. Right, sixty-three seconds. So just a just a minute of rocket burn, um, which I'm guessing is considerably less than you would have if you were lifting off from the ground. Yeah, I mean, imagine all these um, like Apollo Eleven. When, a couple of years ago, we saw so many replays of the Apollo Eleven liftoff. It was brilliant. Loved it. But remember how that first few seconds, it's just like barely moving, barely moving, barely. Yeah. Oh, yep, you can just see it, and it just starts to accelerate. So there's a lot of time in that uh, kind of initial liftoff, isn't there? Yeah, because you've got an enormous weight of fuel on board to get you through the rest of the atmosphere to where you need to go. And so making that move at all takes a huge amount of power. But of course, then when it does actually finally get going, you know, the Apollo rockets were really given a good good hard acceleration there were a lot of what they call g forces a lot of lot of forces of acceleration acting on the astronauts there over quite a long period of time but what you're saying about the the virgin galactic one about unity once it really kicks in with its rockets it's got 60 what 63 seconds of rocket burn i'm guessing at that point you are really starting to feel some fairly significant acceleration forces there but then again it's a much smaller uh, you know, craft is presu- presumably carrying much less weight because it only has to do it for a period of time. So, how do the forces compare? What like what's it like being on board? Are you sort of you know you're passing out from the g forces, or is it actually a fairly gentle ride? What's it like? Well, it's somewhere in the middle, really, because you do have to if you're going to accelerate very very quickly to get to the edge of the atmosphere, then you're going to get some g forces. So, they're estimating with the Virgin galactic flights that you're pulling maybe 3.6 g's which is quite a lot so what that means is that the gravitational force that we experience because we are on the surface of the earth that we call 1 g and that force is characterized by this gravitational acceleration acceleration due to gravity 9.8 meters per second per second yeah so you're just magically multiplying that by 3.6 times and you'll you kind of effectively feel like 3.6 times heavier will be a way to describe it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've just had a quick look online to just get a, a bit of a sense for, you know, you can you can talk about G-forces and stuff and how many times the Earth's gra- Earth gravity, but what, is, what does that mean in terms of stuff that we can actually relate to? And so if you look at driving a car, for example, or being in a car, right? The acceleration, the normal kind of acceleration or deceleration when you're braking in a car, when you feel that push back into your chair as you're accelerating forward or the the push forward um, as you're decelerating, then that's around about an extra 0.3 of a G of acceleration. So let's say a third of a G is what you feel when you're driving in a car. If, um, If you really push it, you might get up to half a G when you're accelerating or decelerating in a car. So this is, you're talking about sort of three, what, three and a half Gs. That's a lot. You're really going to feel that. It is a lot. Um, It's not as much as as what astronauts are trained to deal with. Um, So professional astronauts, obviously they do have to be able to cope with much more G-force than that. They're typically trained, I think, at least at four, maybe five Gs. And above that, you start to black out. And that's partially just due to the blood being pushed away from your brain and so that that's what causes you to black out with too high g forces yeah which is not the sort of thing you'd want terribly often for terribly long the blood being pushed away from your brain i think that's that would be a silly thing to do yeah. no i imagine it's not a great feeling no 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 but we're well and truly <laughs> under that while at the same time you know yeah, the, the richard branson and co in this thing are definitely feeling that they are in a rocket and it's doing something pretty serious, pointing up towards space. Fantastic. How fast do they go? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Well, I guess they travel in their minute or so from about 15 kilometres in height to about 80 kilometres in height. So that's a few tens of kilometres in a minute. (laughs) That's covering some fairly good territory fairly quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they'd be breaking a few a few speed barriers there, I guess, along the way. They'd be well and truly above the, the speed of sound. Exactly, yep. So we call the speed of sound, um, we have Mach numbers. So this is where you the speed of sound is 330 meters per second. Um, and if you go twice that, then that's Mach 2. If you go three times that, it's Mach 3, etc. And do we, do we know, so 
with this one, how fast they were they were they were getting up to we don't really know that we just know it was going fast um i know that they were definitely breaking the sound barrier because you could hear the sonic boom from the spacecraft right. both when it was ascending yeah. and descending um, I'm, I'm sure they're all their systems recorded all this data but there's there, wouldn't there be a difference in the speed of of sound through the stratosphere than through the through the troposphere because it's 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 much thinner you know the air is much thinner um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you get you get a sonic boom from your local speed of sound. So yeah, yeah. so your speed of sound gets faster as you go through less dense atmosphere. But yeah. still, they're they're exceeding that and getting these sonic booms. Regardless, they're going really really quick. Okay, so pointing up, engines burning, sixty three seconds, fantastic, going upwards. How far do they go? <laughs> well, they, yeah, they travel up, up to about 80 k's. And actually, there's a lot of stuff that I guess if you were looking out the window and you could see some of the things that we're going to talk about that may be invisible, but nonetheless interesting, <laughs> um, they can kind of, in that 60 seconds, appreciate some of the things that they could see. So uh, the first thing you'd see in the first from 15 kilometers up to about 35 kilometers up is our ozone layer. So if you ever wondered where the ozone layer was, that's that's where it is. Cool. They just shot straight through the hole in the ozone layer? <laughs> well, no, because that's over Australia, Chris. You know that. Oh, right. Sorry. Sorry. Silly me. Yeah. So you might also see out your nice window some cumulonimbus clouds. So these are the big thunderheads. These are some of the highest clouds that you sort of see when you're on the ground. You, you know, you look up into the clouds. Big thunderheads. They go up to about 20 kilometers, so you might see a few of them. Yep, that'd be cool. You'd get some great cloud formations. Um, you'd whiz past a line which is known as the Armstrong limit, which I thought I haven't heard of before, but I thought was quite interesting. Yeah, what's the Armstrong limit? Um, well, it's named after Neil Armstrong, as you might have guessed. Uh, from I'd, that uh, name. Yeah, I I'd, I'd guessed uh, that, but. <laughs> it's the height at which you need a pressurized suit if you're going to be flying in, a, say, a military aircraft or something like that. Um, so you need to maintain your pressure, otherwise the local pressure is just going to destroy your body. Gotcha. Probably in really horrible ways. Yeah, that's unpleasant. Yeah, so they pass straight through the Armstrong limit. Yep, that's about 18 kilometres. So actually they do all this, this stuff quite quite early on, right? And then at 50 kilometres, you're going to blast um, through the boundary at, uh, into from the stratosphere into the mesosphere. Okay, what's the mesosphere? So the mesosphere is the next bit of atmosphere where the temperature returns to doing, I guess, the more normal thing of getting colder the higher up you go. Right. So we'd, we've left we've left behind the the layer that we've defined as being it's inverted, temperature's doing the wrong thing, and we're going back into, oh, no, no, back to normal now. We'll call this the mesosphere. And that, that starts where and goes to where? It starts at about 50 kilometers and goes up to about 80 kilometers. Okay. So we, we enter that one. Do we see anything when that happens? Or is it just, uh, well, hey, guess what, everyone? We're in the mesosphere. Well, I guess if you're very lucky, this is the layer in which you find meteors. Oh, right. So I, you wouldn't see them really during the day so much because they're not so bright. But if you're flying at night, you might see a few little meteors whizzing past the window. So when you say we, that's where we see meteors, do you mean as in if you go outside and you see a shooting star, then the trail that we would see normally as a shooting star, that's that's where it's burning up? Is that what you mean? That's right, yeah. So this is where we get to see that big glow that comes from. So you, an object comes into the atmosphere, it burns up, it creates that glow, the ionization tail, that's all happening in the mesosphere. Oh, cool. That would be awesome. I mean, that'd be a get, you know, if you just happen to glance out the window and say, hey, meteor. But you wouldn't be able to point it out to someone because it would be just over like that. But yeah, that would be very, very cool. Okay, so we're in the mesosphere. So... How, like, well, we've been burning the rockets for, for 60 seconds or so. We're up into this really high part of the atmosphere. So, Emily, when, when, do, they, when do they get to space? When does that happen? Well, that largely depends on who you are as to how you define space. Ah, is this is this about is this where it's about to get a little bit controversial and a little bit argumentative between billionaires? It is. It is exactly this point where it's going to get a little bit. Uh, we, I think, for all of us normal human beings who aren't billionaires, I think it's kind of splitting hairs. But I think it's interesting to split this hair and see what's going on here because 
Just because it makes billionaires upset means it's kind of interesting in its own right. Especially as there's a lot of there's a lot of money being thrown at this, and there's a lot of ego on the line, and so you bet they're going to argue about it. Okay, so let's let's go with billionaire number one, Richard Branson, in his little space plane thing, which is just rocketed upwards, and that goes to a height of what? How high did they actually get the other day? So I snapped them at something just under 86 kilometers. 86 kilometers. Okay, so on the one hand, that's a that's a long way up, right? On the other hand, it does it really doesn't seem terribly far at all. Like I've I've walked further than that. You've walked further than that on a on a walk across the country. Like it's it's a long way, but it's not it's not actually terribly far. But the most important question, whether it's far or not, the most important question is is it space though, Emily? So did they did they well, get to space before they turned around and came back down again? They got to the US Air Force and NASA's definition of space. Okay. Which they define to be at 80 kilometers high, and that's where you become according to the US um an astronaut and you get your astronaut wings. Right. Now listen, I'm prepared to go with NASA, at least to some degree on this one. If NASA says that's where space begins, then, like, who are we to argue with that? It's NASA. Like, who doesn't know space better than NASA, right? So we're just going to go with that. Rich and Branson wins. He's the first billionaire in space. End of story. Done. Yeah? Problem is that's only really recognized by US kind of organizations. Right. The international community define the boundary to space by using a line that's called the Kármán line, which is the one that's recognized by the International Aeronautical Federation. It's recognized by things like International Space Treaty. And that is set at around 100 kilometers. Right. So they've fallen short of that by a a fair amount. You know, it's 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 not just a little bit. They've actually fallen short by as much as ten or or even twenty percent. Um, is there a quantitative or you know good arguable qualitative difference between these two lines, or are they both pretty arbitrary lines in the sand? What's the difference between them, other than a bunch of kilometers? Well. The the NASA one is completely arbitrary. They just said, where's 50 miles? Turns out it's 80 kilometers. That's that's it. That's space. We're just going to say that's right. space. Okay, cool. that's it. Because it's a good number. Yeah. The common line is a little bit more complicated because it's kind of trying to be based on some physics, but maybe not quite getting there. <laughs> well, let's let's have a look. So the common line <laughs> itself is named after Theodor, Theodor von Kármán. Um, And he was interested in trying to figure out the boundary of space based on the idea that there is a particular point where the atmosphere becomes too thin to support aeronautical flight. And what that means is aeronautical flight is when you have a plane, it has wings, it's using lift from the atmosphere to push itself up. So it's lifting using the density of the atmosphere. Eventually that density runs out. You can't use a plane. It doesn't fly anymore. So you need rockets. Okay. That's, that seems like a good definition. Like NASA's definition of let's pick a number. 50 sounds good. What's that in kilometers? It's about 80. Okay. So we're 50 miles, 80 kilometers above the ground. And that's just a number. And that's what we humans do sometimes. But if you're going to define space as being... When can you not do stuff that you do when you're not in space anymore, <laughs> if that makes any sense? Like, we can fly in planes. Birds, in principle, can fly really high. Um, when can you not do that anymore? Because that's maybe where we, we define we don't have an atmosphere for all intents and purposes. Because the atmosphere, am I right in thinking the atmosphere goes on like a really long way in the sense that you could just keep measuring even very, very small amounts of the Earth's atmosphere for a really long way. We could do that, Ryan. Ages and ages. Okay. Yeah. So at some point we've got to say, when is it spacey enough? And making that definition being, well, you can't fly anymore. You can rocket, you can move, you can you can light up the big bomb underneath your feet and, and go at, at you know very high speeds, but you can't fly anymore. That sounds reasonable to me. Can I posit something here, Emily. 
is the reason that Richard Branson's rocket didn't go higher, does that have anything to do with the fact that it was starting as a plane in the first place and it has a little bit of a, a flyingness about it? Or has that got nothing to do with it and they just they just went for the lower for the lower amount? Um, I don't think it should matter in a sense that I think they could go higher. I don't think they've tested going higher and obviously there's some extra challenges to go another 20 k's higher. But I don't see that would be a problem because what effectively they're doing is they're burning a rocket at this point and then they're just going to let themselves fall back with gravity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, it's easier to control your 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 space plane when you've got some atmosphere to, you know, tilt, tilt the rudder in, to use its flaps, etc. But I don't think they need it. But, okay, so coming back to the Karaman line, though, now that line got then set at 100 kilometers. Turns out if you actually do the maths properly, the Karaman line should be at maybe around 83.6 kilometers. Ah, okay. So this is getting very complicated. So my my interpretation of what you're saying is we've got Richard Branson saying, I've just been to space. You've got um, Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos saying, no, you didn't. And we're going to go to space because we're going to go higher than you and we're going to the actual space, which is set by this Kármán line, which is at 100k. But what you're saying is, well, but Branson got there anyway. And so he can actually say, I got to space first and the other billionaires are crying. Is that is that a fair summation of where we're at at this point? I think so, yeah. By the physics, if you want to use that <laughs> definition by physics, I think then he's safe to say he's gone to space. Excellent. All right. I mean, but I mean, we can put this this kind. I don't of, give a damn either way. But <laughs> we can put this kind of area into context. So once you're above um, fifty kilometers, which we are, we're, we've gone above that. We're in the we've gone from the mesosphere, and actually, the eighty kilometers is the boundary to the next layer of the atmosphere we call the thermosphere. Um, anything above the fifty kilometers is called geospace because this is where you might put satellites, for example, um, and the, so the next definition of the, the atmosphere, the thermosphere, which goes from 80 kilometers to 600 kilometers. So big jump here. Ooh, yeah, that's a long way. Yeah, there's kind of the region where you can put your satellites and they're kind of okay, but you will experience some drag from Earth's atmosphere, right? Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's atmosphere-ish. A little bit. <laughs> These, this is a, there's a very big grey area here between we're definitely in the atmosphere and we might kind of be in space, but we're still kind of a bit in the atmosphere. How high up is the International Space Station? Yeah, so the International Space Station is around 400 kilometres. So that's significantly higher. Um, what's quite cool is that this region we're talking about from 80 to 100, that's, that's about where we see aurorae in the atmosphere. Ah. So you wouldn't say that aurora happen in space. You'd probably say that happen in the Earth's no, atmosphere. No, that's an atmospheric yeah. thing. Yeah, that's an atmospheric thing. So the billionaire got to space, but not really, but kind of. Oh, geez. Okay. All right. Well, look, <laughs> we could argue about this for a very long time, and I'm sure the billionaires are going to argue about it for a very long time. Can we just finish off this particular story of the billionaire going to space this week, though? What happens then, though, right? Like you've burnt your rocket, you're going upwards very, very quickly to a height of 80-something kilometres, but the engine's cut off and you sort of coast for a while. And if I remember correctly, the, the, the spacecraft, the spaceship kind of turns over on its back. And I think it does that so that you get a really good look out through the windows down at the ground, which is kind of cool. Um, but at, at, like, at that point, they're kind of in this free fall, really, aren't they? They're up there, the engines aren't burning, burning anymore, and they're just sort of coasting up in this big arc, and they're going to start coming down again. But that's got to be a really cool interesting part of the flight. What's going on there, Emily? Well, this is the bit that all the billionaires want to pay for, right? This is the right. best bit. This is There's two things that are going to happen at this point which are just amazing. I think both of them are probably maybe worth the, I don't know how much, 250k, I think, you've got to pay if you want to get on to a Virgin Galactic flight. Oh, um, only that? I could sell my house. Easy. 
so the first one that um, you that you, the first kind of thing that you want to be up there to see is actually the view, right? As you say, the, the Earth spacecraft's upside down, so you can see this view of the Earth. And the point, I guess, of being uh, the view being of being in space is that you can actually see the curvature of the Earth falling away, so you can tell that the Earth is a sphere. So if you're a flat earther, maybe this is a flight you should take. You can see the curvature of the Earth. Um, I think they should have a GoFundMe for that. Yeah, yeah. You can see some nice, you can see that the atmosphere is a kind of a blue layer. Um, and you can see, of course, the most exciting bit, I guess, which is black sky. Right. So you're definitely up to the point where, whether you define it physically, uh, atmospherically as space or not, it definitely looks like space. It feels like space. You haven't got blue sky anymore. There's no clouds around you. It's black. For all intents and purposes, you're in space, at least by eye. Is that right? That's right, yeah. And if you happen to be able to tear yourself away from the window, from looking at this gorgeous view, I mean, we're starting to get to the point of kind of astronaut view, pale blue dot view, um, then you might get a little bit distracted by the fact that you are now weightless. Ah, so this is the fun part. You get to do the, the do the astronaut thing, do the floating around the cabin thing. Exactly. Worth the yeah. price, of, price of admission alone. And what's really nice is um, in these flights, you're getting up to four minutes of weightlessness. Wow. Which is a really long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can do that in a plane, right? There are the, the astronaut training planes, the military training planes, which do these ludicrous flying up at a really steep angle. And then they kind of cut the engines for a bit. And so you just go over in this parabolic path. And for that period of time, the plane is basically falling. For a little while, it's it's going up, it's slowing down, and then it starts going down again. So you are weightless. You are in free fall for that period of time. But that's what, like maybe, maybe a, a minute, 30 seconds? I don't know how long it is, but it's not four minutes. It's about, it's about a minute, yeah. The, yeah. No, these are the vomit comets that uh, That's right, mentioned. that's what they're called. Um, the, the only... Yeah, the the slight difference with those is that they are operating at kind of normal aircraft flying altitudes. So what you have to do to achieve weightlessness is you have to fall at exactly the same rate as the spacecraft that you're in. So it's nothing to do with the fact that Earth's gravity is any weaker because, I mean, that just wouldn't even make sense anyway. You've only moved like 80 kilometers away from the surface of the Earth. That's nothing, right? Gravity is pretty much exactly the same at that point. Yeah. If you were to zoom out and see the Earth, right, and there's the Earth as a sphere, and then put a dot on how high up you are, you wouldn't be able to even tell that the the dot is away from the surface. Like, the Earth is really, really big, and 80 kilometers is nothing on that scale. We are nowhere, but it's high enough that you can actually do the do the free fall thing. But you're right, it's not because there's no gravity. A big misconception. It's not that gravity's gone because you're in space. It's because you and the spacecraft are now falling. There's no engine pushing you up anymore. You've just dropped yourself from a great height and you're now going to fall down towards the Earth at the same falliness as the spacecraft. So to all intents and purposes, as far as you're concerned... You're just floating around the cabin, right? Yeah, yeah. So the only difference with that and the, the vomit comets is that they actually, because they're operating in Earth's atmosphere and way down in the troposphere, where that, all that mass and all that density of atmosphere is, they actually have to accelerate when they're on their downwards ones to overcome friction, to overcome ah, the drag force. Right, right. So that must be quite a terrifying thing to pilot. Would you ever want to do that? That's That sounds awful. Like, I just... If there's one thing that a large aircraft is not meant to do, it's that. Like, I would be terrified. It would be an amazing experience, but I'm not sure that I could ever talk my brain out of the whole we're about to die thing, which would kick in, I'm sure, pretty quickly. Whereas, I don't know, I kind of feel like if you're in a spaceship and you know you're in a spaceship because it's literally called a spaceship and it's doing that, that kind of feels like, well, of course, that's what spaceships do, isn't it? You know, we've been taught that from a very young age. Planes, no, you're not meant to float around the cabin in a plane. That means something's very wrong and the plane's probably going to crash. Spaceship, perfectly normal. Absolutely normal. That's what it's supposed to do. That's what I reckon. 
Yeah, well, I, it's it's wonderful to have, I guess, to this extended period of time, and um, they they do call it microgravity because you can start to do things that you couldn't do in sixty seconds, right? If you wanted to run an experiment that was longer than sixty seconds, then you've got to go to the International Space Station. That's pretty much your only option. But now with these kind of things taking off, in fact, even during the Virgin Galactic flight, they were running some science experiments um, in microgravity. And that's what one of the crew members' jobs basically oh, really? was during this flight, was to look after that experiment. Yeah, That's cool. That's cool. I mean, it's nice that they didn't, you know, totally waste it just on the whims of a billionaire. That's That's cool. You know, make use of the time. Yeah. So that's the cool thing. Yeah. So you've got the wonderful view, you've got your weightlessness, and you just get to kind of chill out chill and out. have fun. Yeah. And then presumably, eventually then, you've got to start thinking about, yeah, but we're falling now, falling now. And at some point, the ground's going to come up and meet us probably fairly quickly. So how do they, like, they're not a plane. They're a rocket at this point. They left the plane bit behind. They're now a rocket. How does... <laughs> How does the rocket get get down safely to the ground? I missed that bit. Yeah, no, that's a very important question. Probably the most yeah, important question. Yeah, because as they say, it's um, not the fall, it's the sudden stop that, that gets you. So how do they, what do they do? So I guess this, this is where they are pulling on the aspects of being a space plane. Right. So when they were in that rocket phase, they were kind of all tightly, had the wings of the, the rocket tightly sort of bound in so that they could be a pointy, sharp thing that goes up without much drag. Now they want to do the very opposite thing and become a very big um, sort of fluffy thing that has a lot of drag. I like your description. Yep. Very big fluffy thing going to come in and land. So the technology they use is they're called feathered wings. So they actually rotate the position of the wings so that they come out and become like giant flaps. And they liken this to how a shuttlecock in badminton works to kind of increase your drag, increase your surface area, increase the friction with the air, and that's going to help you slow down. Oh, right. Yeah, I've just I've just looked up some pictures on, on the Google, and yeah, it actually, it is a little bit reminiscent of, I mean, maybe not a shuttlecock, but I kind of see where that's going. You've got all these bits sticking off the back and, and other bits sticking off those, and yeah, it's kind of going from we were a rocket and now we're kind of a plane? And that's enough to get you down safely to the ground and what landing as a normal aircraft would? Yeah, so they just glide back down all the way to the ground. Just, you know, pulling about six Gs on the way back down as you do it. (laughs) Easy, easy, no problem. So all of this went off without a hitch. No billionaires died. No billionaires and their scientists died in the the making of this this amazing aircraft flight into space or not depending on who you ask so that's very cool um so in your experience in discussing all of this with um with sky emily how much of all of that did you actually cover um i think i said the word carmen line once (laughs) i'm amazed you got that out i'm amazed you got that out that's well done i thought you might have just got to yeah space they're in space now kind of they're kind of in space so well done. I mean, you actually got some real science in there. Did you, did you get to explain what that means? Um, I'm not at the level which we've just gone through, unfortunately. I was able to t- say what NASA's definition, what the rest of the world thinks, and that was about it. I did try and sneak some um, secret uh, science to do with rocketry in there on the odd occasion, but uh, sometimes they had to cut away from me because other interesting things were happening. No, that's a shame. But look, most important question, Emily... Did you manage to get a plug for the podcast in there? Oh. Were you wearing your special podcast hat or T-shirt or have the, the poster on the wall or, you know, suddenly throw in a I syzygy? Think it, by this point, everyone just knows that the name Emily Brunston is synonymous with syzygy, so I didn't really think it necessary <laughs> at this point. You thought that would be a bit redundant. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. So, listen, I've just been thinking about – this was Richard Branson, and as we've said, there's, there's multi – multi-billionaires, multiple billionaires trying to do this. So the next one up to the launch pad or the the runway, depending on which way you do it, the next one's Jeff Bezos, Amazon's Jeff Bezos, or ex-CEO of Amazon, really, isn't he? He's sort of given that away, and he's now just just a multi-billionaire doing whatever the hell he wants, I guess. Um, And his 
spacecraft is somewhat different, isn't it? He's not doing the, I'm going to take off from a runway thing. He's actually doing the, I'm going to strap myself into a pod on the top of a big bomb and, and light a match under it, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. So this is Blue Origin, which is Bezos's company, uh, and the rocket which he's going to launch, which happens on Tuesday, actually, July 20th. That's right, um, all going well. Is called Blue Shepherd. Yes. Now, if you go and have a look at a picture of this rocket... Okay, two things come to mind. First of all, it, it definitely looks like a rocket, right? It's, it's, a, it's a long tube pointing upwards with the big burny bit at the bottom and the little pod on top that they strap themselves into. Uh, I guess there's three things. The second thing is it's got really big windows on it. And if you, if you go and look up a picture of, you know, the old Apollo rockets and things like that, their windows were very, very small, yeah? Because windows are a, they're a weak point. You know, and if you're going up into space, you don't want big weak points. You want very small weak points. You don't want all the air to get out and the space to get in. That would be bad. So very small windows. And this one's got really big windows, which is awesome. Like that's going to look amazing when they get up there. The third thing is, I don't know about you, Emily, but this is a very phallic looking rocket to me. You know, like Richard Branson's rocket just... It just looks like a weird shuttlecock thing strapped to a strapped to a, a, a double hulled glider plane thing. This thing really does look like a billionaire who's not thinking with his brain. But I don't. Maybe that's just me. I'm like maybe I'm just reading too much into it. Regardless, it's a big rockety thing, and all going to plan. Uh, Jeff's going to be in space next Tuesday on the twentieth. Yeah. Yeah. So there are some key differences between um, this. I mean, obviously, there's the cosmetic differences, which you've mentioned. They look very, very different. Through uh, to the keeper. We'll leave that one alone. Fair enough. There's the um, height difference, which you've already mentioned. So this Blue Shepherd is um, slated to go at about 100, well, just over 100 kilometers high. Fine. It's only going to be flying for about 11 minutes. So it's really kind of boof, boom, rocket straight up, straight back down. So, so the total whole flight thing, times eleven minutes. Whole thing eleven minutes. Whereas Branson was what a couple of hours. Yeah. Whereas Branson's was about ninety minutes. Right. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, bang for buck for your money. I kind of feel like kind of feel like Branson's in the lead here. You know, you get to feel the whole the rockets just lit up under your under your backside, and you're starting from the ground, and you're going to go very very high. But eleven minutes. That's a that's a lot of dollars per minute there. Exactly. In fact. It's arguably much more expensive because the only person who paid to be on either of these flights, actually. So we mentioned that um, Virgin Galactic uh, selling their tickets at maybe kind of 250000 US dollars last time they were selling them. They're not selling them at the moment to make sure they meet the demand, I think. Now, there is an anonymous person who's going to be on board Blue Shepherd who paid $28 million to what? be on board. Twenty-eight million. <sighs> Don't get me started. I, I I feel a rant beginning, but I'm I'm going to push that down for now. <laughs> There's plenty of rants on the internet at the moment. There are there are um there are petitions on the internet. This this one I love. There are petitions on the internet. Fine if the billionaires want to go to space, but we should not let them come back. You know, and I just think letting people just get this out of their system, go to space, but no, you can't, you can't come back again. You got to stay up there. I, I kind of support that. I, I think that's good. Twenty-eight million for a ride on a rocket for eleven minutes. That's, I don't know. You do the maths. That's a lot of money per minute. And here's what I think is the most jaw-dropping difference between the two. Yeah, go on. So the Virgin Galactic had two pilots and uh, had it. Six crew, well, six people on board, two pilots, four crew, and it can take six um, crew, I think. Did it have someone going around hand, handing out like like um, warm towels and bags of peanuts and stuff? Was there was there someone doing that? There should have been someone doing that. That's quite hard to do when you're at you know sort of three plus G's, I think. <laughs> yeah, you're just up the front of the plane, and you just you just let them go, and they you know they'll just go straight back. I think easy, easy. So, Blue Shepherd doesn't have a pilot. Sorry? What? Blue? It is 100% controlled by a computer. Oh, no. I, I'm not... No. I'm not comfortable with that. I would find that... I would find that somehow much worse. I mean, look, I know that even a standard 
standard commercial airliner these days is mostly automated. But I would feel very, very strange. I mean, look, we can't even have a car driving on a highway reliably without it occasionally killing people. Like, I'm not sure that I want a rocket going, taking me to space and then bringing me back down again without someone to be able to look at and go, it's okay because that person's in charge and they're trained and they know what they're doing. I don't know. Is that is that unreasonable, do you reckon? I think it's a big head turner for us, actually. Yeah, I think it's interesting because this is, we've not really done this with space flight before. It's, it's, it's a different way of doing things. Um, and yeah, I would feel nervous too. I mean, they've, they've done lots of tests. They've, the computer's taken the rocket up. It's brought it back down. It's taken it up. It's brought it back down. It's not done it with people on board yet. So mm. that'll be quite interesting. They've tested it out. Mind you, I mean, if I guess if I think about it, like, you know, if you think about Apollo, right? Apollo 11, go to the moon. How much driving did the Apollo astronauts do for the whole takeoff getting into space bit? And then for the landing down on the ground bit, coming back to Earth through the atmosphere, how much driving did they actually do? And I do kind of remember, like maybe it's a lot. Maybe there are astronauts listening to this who are just prepared to punch me right now. You have no idea. But I, it kind of feels to me like point rocket up, go, you know. And I do remember reading about the, the space shuttle. And this may be apocryphal. I don't know, but it's in my memory, so I'm going to say it. I want to say that they put a joystick in the space shuttle so that the astronauts could land it only because the astronauts said we want a joystick right that the that the whole thing was automated and should come down and land itself but the astronauts were going well we're astronauts like what's the point of us if we don't get to land this thing right like come on give me a joystick i want to land the the space shuttle so i mean really emily is it like do you do much driving on a on a rocket like this in its eleven minutes. Well, I think I think you've actually hit the nail on the head there because this is something that I remember reading about the Mercury program when they were training the astronauts, the first astronauts, when nobody knew what an astronaut was, yeah. how you did it, how do you even train someone for do a job that no one's ever done before? Interesting question in itself. Um, and the astronauts sort of yeah, NASA was saying, oh yeah, but we can automate this part, we can automate this part, we can automate this part, and the astronauts were fighting back and saying, no, we want the controls because this, you know, these people were highly trained individuals. They were you know former fighter pilot, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, incredibly specialist at their jobs. And the idea, I think, of just sitting in this thing and just watching it go <laughs> was abhorrent. Even if it makes it less safe. <laughs> There's an argument that that kind of culture is what makes an astronaut. You want to you want to be in control, right? Ah, uh, so taking that away completely on this one and saying no, no, no. Look, let's not fool ourselves, right? We've got the computers. We run Amazon for goodness' sake. You know, we get your packages to you overnight by drone if you want them. We've got this covered. We're fine. Just strap yourself in. Eleven minutes later, then we can discuss it. Yeah, wow. So it comes to the interesting idea of, you know, if we're so used to this cultural idea of an astronaut being an incredibly clever, incredibly highly skilled, trained individual going to space to do what is mostly science, let's be honest, that's mostly what astronauts' jobs are, to so go and do some science in space, then how does Richard Branson or Jeff Bezos sit in that club is yeah. that one of the reasons why we feel that they're breaking into a group that they're not allowed into because we've built up this cultural picture of what an astronaut is and idolized astronauts, let's be honest, for the last 60 years. They are, there's no, you know, there's nobody who says that an astronaut's a bad person. Yeah, no, that's true. I, I hadn't really thought about that, but you're right. I mean, there's backlash against billionaires billionaires going to space like there's there's clearly a couple of sides to that and one is well surely the money is better spent in other ways and well look let's park that because as i said there are all sorts of really good arguments going on both online and offline about the relative merits of spending billions of dollars or at least 
many, 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 many millions of dollars on these space programs. So we'll, you know, we're not going to do that justice in this podcast right now. That's a whole other, a whole argument. But there's another aspect of it, which I think you're right, is what right do these people, do these men, these white middle-aged or old men, what right do they have to sit in the same chairs as the great astronauts who have been pioneers and explorers? And maybe it's a little bit closer to, look, okay, if you're going up to the International Space Station these days, the important part of that trip is on the International Space Station. You're up there and you're doing stuff. You're doing science. You're doing research. You're carrying out important work for whatever it is we do in space. But the actual getting there, you're basically just living ballast, right? You're living cargo. It's not that you're flying your spacecraft to the International Space Station. It's you're being flown there. And that's the reality now. And so maybe that's the way to look at this is Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Richard Branson are very, very rich bits of human cargo and tourists. And that's what it is now unless you're taking people into space to do something more interesting, like going to the space station or setting up a new base on Mars, on, on the moon or to Mars or something like that. These things are really just about being tourists, I guess. And I guess I think actually that I've read a few of these arguments about, you know, should these people be called astronauts? Is it right? Are they allowed, are they allowed to do this? And I sort of actually fall on quite the other side. I think what they are doing is actually what they themselves claim to be doing, which is making space more accessible. Now, I will, am the first person to jump up and say it's not accessible to all. And it certainly is not accessible yeah, not, to even not you much and me more who are relatively privileged individuals. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's not much. Yeah. But... We have, we have gone from a group of fewer than 500 people who had to go through a selection process. First of all, you had to be born in the right country. You had to be educated the right way. You had to be trained the right way. You know, this is already a very selective group of people. And this is a group of people who are also, I guess, very selective and very privileged, but in a different way. So there is an opening up, right? A very tiny opening up of of more people here, but to me that's just saying you're getting a foot in the door because what is going to happen over the next couple of decades with space travel? It's going to become more. The technology is going to improve. It's going to become more affordable. It's therefore going to become more and more accessible. These are people who are used to running companies who. You can argue with me on this one, but I think at least are aware of social responsibility, if not involved in it actively. It is a line on their balance sheet. I think that's fair to say. Yes. Yeah. Again, huge arguments we could have about this. Let's not for now. Let's save that for the pub. But it is it is a topic of conversation amongst very wealthy people, what their responsibility is to the planet. And that's something that wouldn't have happened 50 years ago, for example, I think. Yeah, I think that's probably so true. So I can see this going in some really positive directions. I can see it becoming more inclusive. I can see it becoming charitable. I can see it becoming scientific in the sense that maybe science experiments become cheaper to run because they, you know, it's much cheaper to launch a space plane than it is to get up to the ISS to do your, your stuff. So it's opening access in that way. So I think broadly, although at the moment we're just seeing the kind of the very emergence of this, which is for very, very rich people playing with their toys, I think that's going to develop into something that's going to give some universal good to all of us eventually. Right. Well, I kind of feel like we've we've taken that one apart. There's there's loads more that we could discuss about the relative merits of billionaires spending their money on big rockets that may or may not look like parts of the anatomy and going into the space and spending their money that way versus other ways. But the bottom line is, I think I think you're right, Emily. I think there's something really interesting in all of this about 
the opening up of space, which previously was only something that entire governments could do, and is now, okay, sure, it's the richest people in the world, but that's that's a different direction. It's going to be an interesting time. But listen, I wanted to ask you, we've got NASA's definition of space, right? We've got the rest of the world's, the international definition of where space starts. Well, what side do you come down on? Where do you, like you're an astronomer, you deal with space. This is your line of work. This is your wheelhouse. So you kind of get the decider on this one. Where do you think space starts? So my personal definition, if you're going to say what space is, we think about the infinite vacuum, the black inkiness of space, right? Yeah. Now, I would say that that is the spaces between galaxies, which we've talked about. As I'm an astronomer, I'm going to go with the space between galaxies. That seems to be our biggest bit of space. That's what I like about you, Emily. You think big. So let's compare the space that we're talking about outer space from the Earth to what the real intergalactic space is. Now, on the surface of the Earth, which is not space, I think we can all agree on that, we have in a cubic metre about 10 to the 27 atoms of hydrogen worth of mass. So 10 to the 27 atoms. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a one followed by a whole lot of zeros. That's a lot of atoms. If we're talking about up at the Karaman line, then we're talking about maybe 10 to the 20 atoms in our metre cubed. Okay. So we've gone down by about a factor of 10 million, but there's still 10 to the 20 left per per cubic metre, which is still a hell of a lot. So do you want to take a stab at what intergalactic space is that I think is probably mm. true space, pure space? I, I, I feel like I'm going to get this so wrong. So, I mean, look, we, we think of space as being empty, and so I'm going to say it's not particularly empty. So I'm going to say, I don't know, like 10 to the 10? Like, I don't know. 10 to the 10? What? Down by another 10 orders of magnitude? You tell me. One. What? what? One? 10 to the zero? Just one. What? In inter... Uh, oh. So, okay. <laughs> um, I was only off by a factor of like 10 billion. Um, that's pretty close for me. So I guess what you're really saying is billionaires arguing over whether... 80-something or 100-something kilometres above the Earth is actually going to space, you would beg to differ. As far as you're concerned, none of them have been anywhere near actual space. Would that be fair? That would be fair. And I think I'm going to issue now this challenge to all the billionaires out there. You get into intergalactic space... And then we'll have some conversations. Yeah, because Voyage is now in interstellar space, but we're still a really long way away from intergalactic. Well, it's challenge set, Emily. And if any billionaires want to get in touch with us, then I don't know. Is there a way that people can get in touch with us on the show, Emily? How can people contact us? We're on all the same social medias as all of the big billionaires. So maybe we should feel good about that. We should. I don't know. Maybe we should. The great equaliser. Yep, we are. We're on Twitter. Where are we on Twitter? How would someone find us? How would Jeff Bezos find us? We are at Pod on Twitter. So that's an at symbol, which is an A with a circle around it. And then S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y-P-O-D. Exactly. And you can use that same handle to find us on the Instagrams. You can go to uh, the Facebooks and find us. Just search for the Syzygy Podcast or Syzygy Pod. You'll go and find us there. We are all over the shop out there on the social medias. Doesn't mean that we're doing a hell of a lot on there, but point is, if you can find us, you can get in contact with us if you've got a couple of spare billion that you want to throw our way to do some experiments in intergalactic space. But you know what looks like a billion dollars, Chris? What looks like a billion dollars, Emily? Our website, of course. Ah, oh, shucks. Where would they find that billion dollar website? So that is syzygy.fm. That is correct. On that fabulous looking website, you can find all of our past shows with all the show notes and the pretty pictures and everything, as well as a contact page and our great wall of thanks for everyone who's given us support over the time that we've been running this show. And if you want to support the show, there's a bunch of ways you can do that. You can just share it around, tell people who are interested in space, particularly if they've got a spare billion, and uh, and share the show around. Tell them that there's this podcast that you've been listening to and they should too. If you want to become a financial member of the show, again, Jeff, Elon, if you're listening, Richard, 
get in touch. Patreon.com slash SyzygyPod, where you can become a financial member of the show and help keep the electrons flowing through the website. Help us to do the live shows that we love to do when the world finally opens back up again. Listen, Emily, I think it's probably time we call this one to an end. I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with the next billionaire's adventure into space. Not because I've got a great joy of watching billionaires spend their money, but just simply because it's kind of an interesting period in history. Are you going to be tuning in? Absolutely. And, you know, if anyone wants to stump me a complimentary ticket, I'm not going to say no. (laughs) Or at least just call you up and get you back on Sky to have a chat about it for a couple of hours. Listen, we will catch you again in a week or two's time. Thanks for joining us on the Syzygy podcast as ever. It's great fun. I've been Chris Stewart. Joining me has been Dr. Emily Brunsden. Emily, I'll catch you again next time. See you later. Bye, everybody. Thank you.